today. I'm going to start the talk just with a brief overview of what GiveWell is and uh, what our research process is, um, so that uh, that sort of sets the, the framework for what we're trying to do with this newer part of our work called GiveWell Incubation Grants. Um, and then I'm going to really shift into talking about the Incubation Grants program, what we're trying to achieve, uh, some of the past incubation grants that we've made, and look forward toward uh, the future of this program. But first, just to start out with uh, GiveWell, uh, we were founded in 2007 by a few donors who were interested in answering the question of how do I give effectively to charity. Uh, they were looking for resources that could help them answer the question of how do I have a big impact with my donation uh, and how do I give to maximize um, my dollars? How do I get the most bang for the buck? And they uh, quickly realized that the type of information that they were looking for did not exist or wasn't available to them. And so uh, left their jobs uh, working in finance at the time to, to start GiveWell uh, a little over 10 years ago. Uh, GiveWell as an organization is very focused on impact. Um, and in particular, we're very interested in uh, providing a strongly evidence-backed list of recommendations for uh, where to donate that can be used by and vetted by anyone. Um, so we're really looking for places where we can make a strong case that the charities that we recommend um, are doing a lot of good. And this has led us to a focus on global health and development uh, for this reason of wanting to make a sort of clear uh, case and pointing to, to the evidence uh, of effectiveness of the things that we're working on. Uh, the product that we produce is a list of top recommended charities that anyone can use. Uh, it's published on our website and we aim to update it about once per year. Um, these are uh, groups that we recommend. We don't take a proportion of donations that are made to those charities. Um, we are independently funded for, for our operations. Um, so our, our role is to serve as a recommender of charities and um, we ourselves are a nonprofit that, that people will donate to support uh, our research. Um, so I, I mentioned that uh, we're looking for charities that are very strongly evidence-backed, cost-effective, so a lot of bang for the buck, Transparent, because we are making a public list of recommendations that we want anyone to be able to vet and decide if they agree with our logic. Um, so transparency is really important to us so we can sort of lay out the full case for our recommendations online. And also that they are in need of additional funding. So we're not just interested in charities that have a strong track record, but charities that also can demonstrate that they need additional funding to do more of the program that we believe to be highly effective. So this has led us to a list of nine current top charities. Um, nine is an arbitrary number. Um, we're, we're looking for groups that meet our criteria, so we're not set on recommending a, a particular number of charities, uh, so much as finding, finding those that, that do meet the criteria that I laid out on the previous slide. And these groups work on programs like preventing malaria, uh, distributing deworming treatments. Um, some of you may have just seen Grace speak about uh, one of those charities, which is Deworm the World Initiative, providing vitamin A supplementation, which we believe uh, may lead to a reduction in child mortality from infectious diseases, uh, enabling seasonal migration, and distributing direct, unconditional cash transfers. So these nine top charities have um, really met a, a pretty strict review process that they go through, and we found that they really stand out um, among all of the groups that we've considered. So this is all to set the stage for our incubation grants program. Um, which is a, a new part of our work that we're doing to try to grow the pipeline of potential future top charities and to improve our understanding of our current top charities. Uh, this work is funded by Good Ventures, which is a large foundation that we work closely with at GiveWell, and that's a major supporter of GiveWell's uh, nine current top charities, uh, as well as you know, many, many parts of our work. And so, the basic idea behind incubation grants is that because GiveWell is looking for groups that are implementing programs that have a lot of evidence behind them, that are implementing or that are charities that have a very strong track record that we can look at, and that are operating at a sufficient scale where we think that they can take in a lot of additional funding, all of this means that another funder has been involved at some point in a charity's process prior to it meeting our top charity criteria. So, you know, in the case of um, 
the Against Malaria Foundation, which is an organization that we recommend that distributes insecticide-treated nets to prevent malaria. Um, the reason that we became interested in recommending the Against Malaria Foundation is because we thought that insecticide-treated nets were a program that had extremely strong independent evidence of effectiveness behind them. There had been a number of randomized controlled trials that were done demonstrating that uh, distributing insecticide-treated nets led to a reduction in child mortality from malaria. This means that someone paid for all of those randomized controlled trials to happen, uh, someone that wasn't give well. Uh, and so, you know, this is a, an organization and a program that we were interested in supporting because someone else had been involved earlier in the pipeline. And similarly, you know, all of our organizations that we recommend have been around for enough years that we felt we could look back at their work and say, we think that they're going to do more of this good work if we direct more funding to them. And so, a few years ago, um, back in late 2013, we started to think about the fact that we, at that time, had really been recommending a fairly consistent group of top charities. Um, we've been recommending the Against Malaria Foundation, uh, a couple of deworming charities, and Give Directly, the direct cash transfer charity, uh, for a number of years, and we weren't finding things that seemed like they were beating those opportunities that met our criteria. And so we sort of wondered whether we might be able to step in at that earlier stage in the pipeline and uh, be the funder that helps develop things that might potentially meet our criteria in the future and sort of look for opportunities that seem really promising but aren't yet uh, at the point where we would recommend them as a top charity. And so that was sort of the origination of the incubation grants program. Um, so there are really three different types of incubation grants that, that we've made so far. Um, the first is providing early stage funding to promising organizations, so groups that are maybe implementing a program that seems really promising, um, but aren't at the point where they have a strong enough track record for us to feel like, uh, you know, we're really sure that, that if we direct more funding to them, uh, we can kind of demonstrate that, that they will have additional impact. So, so sort of providing this early stage, kind of classic incubator style funding. Uh, the second type of incubation grant that we make is uh, grants to fund research into promising programs. So I mentioned the example of someone funding uh, the randomized control trials into insecticide-treated nets um, that really helped us understand uh, the impacts of, of that program and got us interested in supporting the Against Malaria Foundation. So we ourselves are interested in funding research into programs that seem really promising. And, and this is a bit distinct from seeding potential charities, since this might be more along the lines of an independent academic study that's you know, not uh, being implemented by a charity, but just understanding better whether a particular program uh, is, is, a, is a successful one. And then the third category is uh, supporting monitoring. So one of the major questions that we ask when we're assessing a top charity is, how strong is their monitoring? How likely are they to know that they are successful in reaching the people that they're aiming to reach with their programs? How likely are we to know about any potential problems that arise? And really, how do we sort of understand their work as it's being implemented? Um, and monitoring is, is quite expensive to do well and, and quite challenging. So we have come up to a number of organizations where Monitoring is really, a lack of monitoring information is really the challenge for us in recommending them, where they're implementing a program that we sort of look at the independent evidence and it looks really uh, successful, and you know the charity itself seems good, but, but we haven't yet seen the kind of monitoring that we'd like to see. And so we're interested in whether we can fund uh, the support of and development of monitoring programs in cases where that is sort of the challenge to, to give while recommending something. Um, so just to quickly talk about a few different past incubation grants that we've made. Um, we've made many more than the three that I'm about to highlight, and they're all listed on our website if you're interested in seeing the full, the full list of incubation grants, um, since there's a lot going on with this program. But these three, I think, are good sort of uh, broad case studies for, for the types of grants that we're making. So the first one I wanted to talk about is a group called New Incentives. Um, this was the first incubation grant that Yoel ever made. Um, we made. We made our first grant to them back in January 2014, so right at the beginning of the incubation grants program. And the program that we initially recommended them for was a conditional cash transfer program that was geared at encouraging 
pregnant HIV positive women to deliver in health facilities with the aim of preventing mother to child transmission of HIV. So New Incentives was a very new organization at that time. Again, did not yet have the sort of track record that we want to see uh, before we made it a uh, give well top charity, but, but it seemed really promising to us. And this program looked like it might you know, plausibly be a quite cost effective way to, to do a lot of good. And so uh, over the next few years, uh, we sort of watched this program with, with incubation grant funding uh, develop and um, new incentives uh, came to realize that they wanted to broaden the program to um, not just focus on pregnant HIV positive women, but uh, focus on encouraging all women to deliver in health facilities using their conditional cash transfers. Um, they found that there, were, there weren't enough um, pregnant HIV positive women that they were reaching, and so they were interested in sort of broadening the program. So there was a bit of an evolution there. And at the end of 2016, um, we felt that, that we were positioned to sort of review the evidence that we had learned through this incubation grant so far and decide whether we might want to you know, proceed with, with assessing this as a, as a top charity opportunity. And what we ultimately concluded at that time was we didn't think that the evidence for encouraging uh, women to deliver in health facilities was strong enough for GiveWell to make a recommendation of new incentives for that program. But we had also gotten um, familiar with new incentives work and thought very highly of them as an organization. And so we made an additional incubation grant to enable them to uh, shift their program to another conditional cash transfer program where they're now focused on uh, encouraging, using cash transfers to encourage uh, parents to bring their children in for routine immunization schedules in Nigeria. We're now at still the early stages on, on that particular program. Um, they are running a randomized control trial of that program in partnership with a, a group called ID Insight, which I'm going to talk about soon as they are another uh, incubation grant recipient. And we'll be looking for the results from, from this study over the next couple years. Um, so I think New Incentives is a, a good kind of case study on um, both sort of the iterative nature of the program. You know, they, they have shifted their um, focus a few times through this, uh, and also just to give a sense of kind of the ways in which we're assessing organizations and um, and what the timelines are, where you know there might be quite a long lag from an initial incubation grant to um, becoming a top charity if, if that ends up being the outcome. Uh, the second organization that I wanted to highlight here, um, Grace uh, Hollister mentioned this briefly in her talk just now as well, um, is an organization called New Lean Season, uh, which is run by Evidence Action, the parent organization of Deworm the World Initiative, which is, as I mentioned, one of our, our longtime top charities. So No Lean Season um, was, I think, our second incubation grant. So again, like fairly early stage in our, in our incubation grant um, process. And they are doing a program to uh, provide interest-free loans to rural agricultural workers uh, in Bangladesh to enable them to temporarily migrate during the time of year when agricultural job opportunities tend to be scarce. And this program was uh, initially studied by a Yale economist, uh, Mushfiq Mubarak, who um, ran a randomized control trial of a small version of this program in 2008 and found that it seemed like uh, providing these uh, small uh, subsidies to enable people to migrate was really effective um, at encouraging migration and increasing uh, incomes during this, this challenging time of year. And also that there was some evidence that uh, people tended to re-migrate, even in the absence of incentives in following years. And we became aware of the study and, and thought it seemed like a potentially you know, very cost-effective, promising um, program. But again, the, the scale of the program at that time was reaching something like 2,000 households in that initial randomized control trial, so not kind of a large enough um, scale, and also, you know, had just a single randomized control trial behind it. So not, not quite at the give well level of evidence, we're really looking for um, a very strong body of evidence behind uh, programs we recommend them. Uh, but we connected with Evidence Action uh, in, I think it was late 2013, uh, as they're also interested in, in taking uh, promising randomized control trials and programs that have kind of initially um, strong looking evidence and scaling them and studying them. And so we made an incubation grant to Evidence Action uh, to scale this program. And uh, that was in 2014. Uh, there were, I think, four more randomized control trials or three additional randomized control trials that were run under late season. 
um, in, in the years that followed. And in 2017, uh, we thought that uh, no lead season was now operating at the kind of scale that we were interested in uh, assessing as a good top charity. They're reaching about 100,000 households. And also that the, you know, with the addition of all these new randomized control trials, that the evidence base for the program was finally looking robust enough that we thought, you know, this is the kind of thing we want to look at um, as a potential GiveWell top charity. And so we sort of did our standard charity review uh, process on annually season for our top charities, um, which I mentioned, you know, really digging in on the four criteria that we look for, the cost effectiveness of the program, the evidence base, um, you know, and how much funding they need to scale. And at the end of 2017, uh, we concluded that, that No Lead Season did meet our criteria. And so they are the first organization that has sort of gone all the way through our process and, and graduated from receiving an incubation grant to being one of our, our you know, short list of top charities. So um, this, is, this is sort of the first, the first of what we hope to be, you know, others to come uh, through the incubation grants to, to end up on our top charities list. And the, the final incubation grant recipient that I wanted to highlight here, um, I mentioned their name earlier, uh, they're a group called ID Insight. And they're a bit different than the other two groups that I just mentioned, as they are not um, themselves, they're, they're a research-focused organization. So um, we're excited about ID Insight because they focus on providing um, implementation-relevant evidence uh, to policymakers and organizations that are operating on the ground. So I mentioned randomized control trials um, a few times. Like that's one type of evidence that, that we think is, is really helpful. Um, it's not the only type of evidence that we look at, and I'm happy to talk more about that. But um, what we found is that a lot of times, you know, randomized control trials um, that are conducted by academics, um, they're done by, by individuals who have different incentives than, than top charities. You know, they have career incentives that diverge from providing the most implementation-relevant uh, information possible. And so ID Insight really, we think, fills a unique gap uh, in the development sector by coming in and helping us um, really answer like very specific questions about context in which programs are operating. Um, and so we have made grants to ID Insight to support the development of a team there. Uh, we call it the ID Insight uh, Embedded GiveWell team to help us answer some of the questions that we have about implementation and about um, program effectiveness. So I mentioned them earlier when I was talking about new incentives. Uh, they are the organization that is uh, helping run the randomized control trial of that um, routine immunization program. Uh, they have also worked with us on um, projects to better understand the monitoring that's being done by one of our current top charities, the Against Malaria Foundation, to better understand how beneficiaries of our top charities um, make trade-offs between health and income increasing uh, interventions and a variety of other projects that I'd be happy to talk about. So we're really excited about um, having a partner that can help us uh, through our incubation grants really dig in on some of our, our big research questions that uh, give well ourselves uh, doesn't find easy to answer on our own as sort of desk researchers based in San Francisco. So. Just briefly looking forward to some of the plans for the future. Um, if you were at the panel last night, I mentioned um, that we're looking into some of the, these areas that are a bit riskier, a bit harder to prove um, the cases for impact. So, so things like policy advocacy um, interventions as being potentially an area where uh, there might be very cost-effective opportunities to help, but the evidence base is uh, not so simple as, as um, you know, randomized control trials that we see on certain uh, health interventions. And so through the incubation grants program, I think we're hopeful that we'll be able to um, fund research to help us answer important questions that might enable us to recommend, uh, recommend things that are outside of the scope of what we've previously been able to recommend. Um, all of this, to be said, um, is going to be done within uh, GiveWell's broad framework of transparency, where our bottom line goal continues to be producing a list of top charities where we lay out the full case for those recommendations and, and why we think that they are excellent opportunities for people to support, and um, being very transparent about our reasoning, reasoning and logic. So even as we're expanding into areas that are harder to prove, um, that might rely on um, more challenging to parse pieces of evidence, um, all of this will continue to be driven by our um, 
uh, you know, mission to, to produce a public list that, that anyone can use and, and vet and check our logic and, and see if you agree with us. Um, so, you know, just to conclude briefly, to put this in the sort of broad context of GiveWell, I think the sort of major development within the incubation grants program is that we're now able to be involved sort of across a charity's life cycle. So where GiveWell of the past, uh, sort of our traditional work, really came in, you know, relatively late in an organization's life cycle, or at least not at the very beginning of it, I recommend them. Uh, we're now able to do things like funding research into pro programs that haven't been well studied to um, increase our understanding of those programs, to, to take an organization that seems really promising, um, but is at the very beginning of existing, and help it scale so that we can see whether it's something that we might want to recommend. Um, we can help an organization do monitoring by funding that work, uh, such that we can better understand the impact of its programs. And then we finally, you know, ultimately can add organizations to our list of top charities, and that will uh, direct significant funding to support their programs, which by that point in the process, you know, we believe to be extremely evidence-backed and very cost-effective. And so last year, our, our nine top charities received around $117.5 million as a result of our recommendations. We can, you know, provide significant funding once a charity is uh, on the list of top charities or the, the end of this process. Um, so I'm going to pause there um, and hopefully we have a few minutes for questions. Um, and yeah, glad to talk about that or any other questions about our research process. criteria. Um, what we're looking for, um, what we're really looking for within education would be very strong evidence connecting uh, interventions to uh, life outcomes like increased incomes. Um, so, so there is quite a bit of evidence uh, within the education space that focuses on sort of near term uh, outcomes like school attendance or test scores. What we're, looking, what we're really looking for at GiveWell is uh, this kind of later in life, you know, increase in income that would result from education. And we haven't yet seen um, seen that meet our criteria, the, the evidence base that would answer that particular question. Um, I think education is an area you know that's, that's obviously like going to stay on our radar, and we'll be interested to continue to follow um, the research that comes out in that space. But it's not currently something that we recommend. So, what are your thoughts on the multiplicity of charities? So, when a lot of charities have the same goal, um, is there room for bringing charities together to work towards the same um, cause area? Yeah, so you know, one of the questions that we have when we're, we're looking uh, at charities that we're interested in recommending is, you know, are they operating in an area that wouldn't otherwise be served with the program that they're implementing? So um, I think that we, we ourselves are interested in, in finding things that aren't being duplicated. And I think that there um, you know, are a number of sort of coordinating bodies for, for some of the bigger um, programs and interventions that do play some of a role of like looking at where sort of the, the global needs are. But I think it's a really important question to have in mind and, and something we kind of look for when we're looking at the funding gaps that we're trying to fill and also the organizations that we're supporting. Um, and is there a policy of separation between the people involved in selecting the charities for incubation and the people involved in evaluating them? So are they blinded in any way? Yeah, uh, the charity incubation process is not blended, and we're quite transparent through the whole process. Um, so we, uh, you know, will typically identify charities for incubation grant work uh, via, you know, uh, conversations that we have with folks who work in the global health space. Um, in the case of Evidence Action, through through knowing that organization well from from uh, if having charities on our list in the past, um, we'll also learn about promising programs by by following journals. Um, you know, we're a pretty small research staff and we share our learnings along the way. So it's not a sort of blinded process of, of who within GitWell is assessing um, particular opportunities. 
Um, but I think you know we maintain very strict criteria and transparent reasoning about why something makes it to our top charities list. So I think that um, is a good way in which we hold ourselves accountable to really making sure that the things that we recommend are the things that, that meet our criteria. Um, and what would be some reasons for starting a charity versus a social enterprise? Yeah, so this is um, a question that comes up a lot as you know, thinking about charities versus social enterprises. I think in Gibwell's view, we're not convinced that having a social enterprise mission um, would necessarily um, make it easier to do a lot of good. I think you can end up with um, sort of competing efforts in terms of, uh, or competing sort of bottom lines for bottom line for doing good and, and bottom line for, for making a profit um, that can be challenging. And so, you know, we ourselves are, are somewhat agnostic. I think we would be open to funding something that would be in the social enterprise space if it met our criteria, but historically have found that the uh, opportunities that we have recommended have been sort of direct service charities and direct del that uh, directly deliver um, things like nets and deworming treatments, because those have tended to be the things that we think um, sort of achieve the most good per dollar according to our criteria. And I just want to squeeze in one more question. Um, so New World does a great job of cost prioritization based on cost effectiveness. If your mission is to do the most good possible, what about the mass appeal of charities, i.e. the capacity of a cause to raise more donor dollars in cause prioritization? Yeah, so um, in terms of, I think the question is kind of, you know, maybe give well could do more good by um, appealing to more donors, even if it uh, isn't the things that we give well think are the most uh, cost effective. It's interesting because um, when Gimbal was started, I mentioned we've been around for about 10 years, a little more than 10 years, uh, we actually did have more of a, a menu-based approach at the beginning. So we'd say like, if you're interested in education, here's what we think is the most effective thing there. If you're interested in global health here, um, US uh, inequality was another area. And we found that the donors who were using GiveWell were really just interested in where they could have the most impact per dollar. And the sort of menu-based approach uh, wasn't what drew them in, they really wanted to know how do I maximize you know, the amount of good that I can accomplish with my dollar. And so I think you know, our, our mission is still to, to find the things that we believe to be the most cost effective. Uh, we've done very little proactive outreach in the past, and so I think we don't believe yet that we've reached everyone who is interested in giving in this particular way. So I think there is, um, we think, still quite a lot of room to grow in terms of reaching people who um, would connect with our mission and really be interested in, in things that are sort of as cost effective as, as we can find uh, by our criteria. Thank you. There are so many more questions, but that's all we have time for. So can we all give a round of applause to Catherine?